So, I have <laughs> some buyers that are struggling with picking out their poppies. And it is hard. You know, you're trying to make a decision. <laughs> They're all trying to get on my lap. So this is, they're going to pull on my clothes. And, as you can see, that's sassy. She's got her ears up. I've got one taped. She's doing pretty good now. I got switched foods with her. And I think she needed a food switch. So she's starting to put her weight back on. And she's over there talking. Talking. I got one down here pulling on my dad's pudding. Pulling on my clothes. <laughs> They're sassy again. She says, I want attention. I want attention. I would have to say of the four puppies, she's the quietest. The others are a little bit more vocal than she is. Hey, kiddo. She's right there. Nah. Nah. That's Justin. That's Puddin' next to her. And that is Journey. Journey. We've been taking them with us in the car for little car rides because we want them to be able to get adjusted. They are able to drink out of a bowl. That's the kind of bowl we use for water. It has a rubber bottom and a stainless steel interior. Easy to wash. This is a Corandicot. It's a type we use outside and inside. These big ones are for outside. Um, the interior ones are smaller and they have a cloth surface which can be washed. You can actually unscrew them and wash the cloth surface or you can hand wash it with a soap and they love these little cuts. They're short. They can climb under them. <laughs> That's sassy right there. Hey! Hey kiddo. You see her with her ears up. Looking cute there. Looking cute there kiddo. And that is Miss Puddin chewing on the edge of the bench. Um, next to her is Justin and Journey. So, um, the reason that I like the Corandicots is because they are totally washable. They have very few chewable parts unless it's tipped upside down and they can pull the rubber stoppers out of the bottoms, which you want to make sure they don't do. Um, the cloth ones are nice. They create a very joint-friendly sleeping environment. And we just put a sheepskin pad, a washable one over the top, you know, the fake lambskin, or whatever blanket that you like. And that works out really good. They, can, they, they do love to chew on them. They'll chew on the corners and have lots of fun with that. But as a rule, they can't chew them apart. I've never seen them chew one apart. And that, I've got some French Bulldogs can be incredible chewers. So, um, these are some of the, to this is like a Nyla bone they've chewed the crap out of. And that is one of our, oh, I gotta find it. Hello, where are you? Let me bring it up bigger. There we go. That's one of our buffalo horns that we get at the pet store, usually Chuck and Don's. And I would say these puppies, they're sassy. She's my little diva she wants. She's the attention girl. Give me attention, I want to be loved. She's a really sweet, cuddly girl, but she's a lap girl. She likes to be in your lap. She wants to be in your lap. And uh, so she's going to get your attention. She'll pull on your pant legs, pull on your shoes, whatever it takes to get your attention. I want attention. She is a attention lover. Um, they are learning how to do some very basic things. Basic things like walk on leashes. And uh, after they get their second set of shots this week, they'll start going to handling classes and learn how to socialize and be part of the big dog world. For what would be the big dog world for them. We're allowing them to run in the yard with the adult dogs limitedly because I have a couple of them that are buffaloes and they're rough. So um, yeah. 
But anyway, I'm just doing this little short video for a certain particular person who asked to see it. Um, once he decides which puppy he wants, there will be one remaining puppy left. Uh, it will be a girl, and she should potentially go to a show breeding home. Someone that's serious about doing that and, per, you know, propagating this bloodline. Um, I believe that is Miss Journey. Miss Journey is going to be a good size girl. I would say she is the biggest puppy in the litter. But as females generally don't get as big as males, I expect her to end up in the 26, 27 pound range or less. The other girls, I think Peanut will probably only make about 22 pounds. And then um, Sassy will probably end up around 24, 25, probably as an adult. <coughs> oh, somebody got their footy bit. Or they got it stuck under something. Um, what I like about these puppies, if you're a breeder kind of listening in, what I like about them is their very old-fashioned soundness type mobility. They're very laid-back personalities. Um, the old French Bulldogs were smart. They weren't hyper. They weren't shy. They were smart. And they were um, easy to work with because they picked things up quick and they didn't forget them. They did not have this crazy Euro temperament, and I'm sorry, that is primarily where it came from. Um, they were pretty steady dogs, pretty easy to live with, relatively healthy and sound. They could handle uh, stress, average stress, in a reasonable fashion. They did have somewhat, um, not, not the couch potato personality, that is Miss Journey talking to everybody else and sassing. She's just sassing them. Um, these top lines on these dogs I think are perfect for this age. They have some sign of a potential roach. They have enough loin to roach. And for me that is significant. They still have tails at this point. I don't know if you can see them. Miss Sassy is chewing on my foot. She is saying, why are you not paying attention to me and playing with me? Can't you see I need to be held and I need attention? <laughs> She's been this way since she, she came out of the whelping box. Pay attention to me. Pay attention to me. Yeah, I'm a lover, not a fighter. But she is our quietest puppy of the litter. Um... So, in, in the necessity of keeping this relatively short so I can get it up quickly. <laughs> I don't know who that, who is stuck under the crane? <laughs> God. They like to go under there and then they do the sort of, oh, that's Justin. This could see the big number one on his chest. I don't know if, it, <laughs> if God thought it was funny to put a number one on there so we'd know he was the only male, just in case we're that old. <laughs> I have no idea why he did that, but he, I've noticed that God has a, an incredible sense of humor. And he's also, he knows how stupid we are. We aren't called sheep for a reason, you know, without a reason. He calls us sheep without a shepherd if we're not with him. Anyway, <laughs> I think maybe he figures between our age and whatnot, he'd better point out the obvious, which sometimes when you get this old, your priorities begin to change. And uh, you're looking more forward to convenience and security than you are to taking risks and even to adventure. You're just looking forward to, I guess, getting safely down that runway into eternity. Maybe that's the way to look at it. But um, these two are having a wrestling match up here. That's Sassy and Justin wrestling with each other. And Justin, because he's a boy, he naturally turtles. 
he rolls on his back and turtles and says, come and get me, because he's big, and he's like a little boat. So, yeah, I'm going to probably shut this off. That's uh, Justin there. And, um, hey, buddy. That's like the big honking, those big honking Enstrom ears on them. You can see those big honking Enstrom ears, and I like them. I like the soundness they have in their bodies and their their overall strength and agility and yeah I'm real pleased with them and people say well, why do you want to use those old bloodlines let me tell you something open up your mind take your pedigree open it up seven to nine generations and look back there these bloodlines these dogs are the framework and foundation of all of your dogs every single one of you out there this dog will be in your pedigree even if you have a straight year old pedigree, this dog, the sire of this litter, is going to be in your pedigree. So, however you choose to look at it, the only thing you can do, going back to the foundation of a bloodline, is to bring back the purity of it, the best possible characteristics of it, and solidify them into that generation, that bloodline. Your goal here is to create improvement, to return to foundational type. There's way too much Eurotype in American breeding now, and hey, kiddo, boop, 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 boop. and it's not a positive. I'm going to be honest with you, it's not a positive. There are some great things about the Euro dogs, but you have lost your lower jaws, you've lost your width of the lower jaw. You have lost the, the correct bite, the correct undershot and turn up. You've lost the tails. You've lost the top line, the correct top line, which should have had sufficient loin to create a roach over the loin. You've lost that, and you've brought in colors that you never, ever wanted that have no ability to improve this breed in any way. I mean, we looked at that back in the days before the DNA, and we knew that. We knew that there was very little way that they could enhance the, enhance the breed. What we didn't know was the genetic package back there. They thought it would bring in more variability. Think about it. Let's apply some brain power and think about it. Where did those dogs with the colors come from? The blue, the black and tan, the liver, they were always there in all the bloodlines. You're not bringing in any new genetic package. There's no new genetic material in those colors. Absolutely none, except potentially the blue merle, which could be an outcross to another breed. There is no new material. So don't lie to people and tell them that those colors are healthier because, you know, they haven't, they're exactly as lined and inbred as every single other dog out there. So don't even listen to that because it's a complete lie. They have nothing new to offer this breed. And, and, and unfortunately, in terms of health, they have nothing to offer it either. I wish they did. But now that black and tan pattern's ingrained into the fawn, and unfortunately, it was that it's not an improvement. It's not a color improvement. So it, and it's certainly not an improvement in pigment. It's not an improvement in type. It's not an improvement in health or soundness. There is nothing there that is an improvement. You know, so anything that that a breeder could potentially tell you about, yeah, you know, it's a, that those colors add more variability in genetic. Uh, no, they don't. They don't add anything to it. All you have to do is look at the pedigrees and look for yourself. It doesn't take a big brain to figure this out. So, anyway, got to close this soapbox over, and I hope you got a chance to see what you needed to see there. Um, off we go.